Welcome back to Fret Buzz the Podcast. Today we're getting into part two of Finger Style with Dustin Furlow. I just want to pop over to iTunes and read you one of the reviews that we got from Drifting Along. Uh, he gave us a five-star review and said it was very insightful. He goes on to say, I just listened to episode seven, It's a Musical Life. I really enjoyed this one. Well thought out ideas. Interesting to hear the different perspectives from people who have lived through a variety of musical lifestyles. We'll definitely check out more episodes. If you guys have any reviews, hop on over to iTunes and give us a review. I'll read it out. And without further ado, let's jump into episode 29 with Dustin Furlow, all about finger style on Fret Buzz the podcast. Two questions. With you having a album coming out, mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of interested in A, your approach to your compositions, how you go and write something. Is it more through theory? Is it more through ear? Um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of one direction I would like to kind of ask you about. And then earlier on, you had talked about uh, hopefully in the future touring. Uh, I would like to kind of get on uh, a little bit into how you get your gigs and um, a manager, if that's in your future, or how you see your touring schedule and how you're going to go about that. So kind of a two, two different directions I would love yeah. to hear your thoughts on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, good questions, too, because I, I, I did want to talk about that at one point, um, arranging and making your own instrumental music. That seems like an impossible task for a lot of guitarists. Right. That, you know, aren't that haven't submerged themselves in that area of guitar playing. Uh, I know for me, like I said, I, I learned a lot of arrangements from Andy McKee and Tommy Emanuel, Jimmy Walstein, and a couple of guys that I looked up to. And I kind of got a feel for, um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the best guitarists, they follow the same sort of formula that pop songwriters use. Um, and also, I've, I've learned a lot of covers. Obviously, I play in a lot of venues, sometimes for three to four hours um, locally. Right. I know that I've learned all these pop tunes and I know that how they're arranged. Okay. Is it the standard verse one, chorus one, verse two, chorus two, bridge, final chorus, outro, whatever. Right. That's sort of the basic um, structure for a pop tune. You can get away from that. You can add pre-choruses. You can do multiple bridges, key changes, whatever. Um, but having learned how a lot of those songs that have been successful for other people um, are put together. That's helped sort of guide me when it comes to writing instrumental music. I know Tommy Emanuel, getting back to him, I think, again, he's a great reference for people that want to be musical with their instrumental guitar playing. Um, when he was talking about how he warms up, he's like, I just play songs. Like, I don't go back there and practice scales. I want to be musical. So I want to play a song. I want to play the melody. I want to switch. I want to ebb and flow. I want to switch from chorus to bridge or, you know, whatever. I want to feel those changes and breathe the music and get my mind where it needs to be. And so for me, a lot of times when I'm about to start sitting down with a new tune, like I've come up with a cool verse idea, mm -hmm. I'll just play something else. You know, I'll, I'll try to get through a whole tune and see if I can embellish and change things and then I'll tackle that tune. And I, I think it helps a lot to have a good roadmap of, okay, what do I want to do with this tune? Like for instance, I have a song that is going to be on woodscapes that I called, um, finally, and it's in standard tuning, uh, key of a, which has been pretty, pretty friendly key, at least for me. And, um, it has, uh, there's, there's an intro, verse pre-chorus chorus verse two and then straight to a chorus it skips the pre-chorus the second time sort of just to keep on the keep the listener's attention yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and then we go to a bridge key change and then outro which is the same as the intro a lot of times i'll recycle an intro reintroduce the idea just the same way a jazz guitar player will introduce reintroduce the theme you know after they've soloed for a while so um yeah, to answer your question, uh, I write compositions usually in the same structure as a lot of pop tunes that I like, or, you know, uh, I go off of how I've 
written my own tunes that have lyrics that I actually sing, I'll, you know, I like to stray away whenever possible from that, you know, common structure of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, right, right, right. Or whatever. Um, but you know, with instrumental music, it's cool because a lot of times I would actually say most times instrumentals aren't really meant to be hummed or sung, I guess, or well, obviously not sung, but, uh, the melodies are kind of, they're not always meant to be catchy, like with a pop tune where there's a voice, you know? So right, right, right. a lot of times instrumental acoustic guitar players, they want to go off of a technique or an idea. Um, so what I've tried to do on a couple of my tunes, like what's this, I got a list here. So I wrote, I actually wrote a tune called Andy's gift and I started writing it during hurricane Florence, finished it uh, within a month or two, month or two. And that's, that tune was, it started because I learned a new Andy McKee tune, um, Dreamcatcher, and I borrowed a hammer on idea. He does hammer on, it's like a hammer on to a triple roll. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of embellishes with those. So I borrowed that and I just decided, okay, well, that's Andy's gift. He, I, I borrowed that technique from him and from it came a song and it's pretty much, you know, the simple intro, uh, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus. There's a bridge that modulates. And then what I usually like to do after bridges, you know, four out of five times with my tunes is I'll re I'll either reintroduce the intro or I'll switch up the verse. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm very much um, songwriting forward with instrumental arrangements. I don't like to just make noise and shred. You know? Well, how about your in terms of the arrangement? Uh, well, how instead of your arrangement, how about your melodies and how you go about creating a melody? Um, how do you come up with those? And then once you've finished, let's say uh, a verse. Or how do you come up with the chorus? What is your process of going like the transition and how do you come up with the melody? Um, it's a lot of times it's out of order. Um, I, I, there's, let me see. Um, there's a tune I wrote called the elder tree and the chorus of that, um, Be beautiful song, by the way. <laughs> oh, you listened to it? Oh, oh well, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. The elder tree, um, the chorus for that are it's a set of harmonics, mm -hmm. uh, very hummable melody. Um, and it's again, it's in the key of A. So I actually use the open A, D, and E strings for that chorus. It works, it works so well. Got really lucky when I wrote that. Um, but I came up with that, the chorus first. Okay. So, um, now, do you do that? Do you do do you use theory to come up with your ideas or do you just kind of hear something in your head and apply it to the neck? It's, it's both. Um, a lot of times if I'm playing, sometimes, like I said, I get lucky and mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll noodle. And if something comes out, it sounds like, Oh wow, that's a cool idea. Um, there's some things that are really theory focused. Um, for instance, I wrote a tune called sky Comish river and that's very classical influenced, uh, the structure of it and the key changes and the, the weird inversions and stuff. Okay. I don't usually get really into like, I don't try to put theory behind the wheel as much as just, you know, from the heart. Yeah. Can I hum this? And it sounds pleasant, you know, right. like I said, songwriter. Sorry. Sorry. Are you humming from, do you have a key that you're starting with and you're noodling and humming within that key? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I always, pick the key, you know, depending on whatever, depending on whatever section is made first, like for instance, with elder tree, that noodle that became the chorus, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that's in the key of a, my song is in the key of a, cause I'm going to work around that chorus. I like it a lot. And from there, um, you know, if, if that's the case, if you come up with a chorus, so if the first part of your tune that you write and you're like, Oh wow, that's awesome. If that's the light bulb moment, you have to sort of, backtrack if you're going to go to your verse you have to be like okay well what's the conversation leading up to this mm -hmm. so for the elder tree for instance when i did the verse it just became a very like playing for you not at you sort of thing where i'm walking down from an open a and it's it's an actually it's actually a pretty repetitive melody but because of the bass notes that are walking down in the uh, verse 
Yeah, in the first verse, yep. Yeah. Um, it it kind of becomes like a story, like here's the intro to the story. And by the time you get to the chorus, you're like, oh, okay. And that's starting to, well, hopefully get interesting. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, I, I thoroughly like, enjoyed the Elder Tree. I think it was oh, great. especially when you do the, the leading tone with a, you do, it's cool. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that tune's really special for me. And in fact, if you can see it right here. This is that melody. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I had it tattooed on my arm. Awesome. But yeah, um, but that tune is very much written like a Tommy Manuel song. It's very much like structure. This is meant to keep a listener interested who isn't into fingerstyle music. Okay. It's meant to, you know, not specifically that somebody who's not into it, but for somebody who isn't into fingerstyle music, they have to have some sort of common ground. So you have to have either a melody or a structure that is familiar to them as, as they would hear in a pop tune or, you know, so there's repetitive parts in that order tree and it does follow the basic, um, intro verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, bridge, mm. uh, turnaround, which is the intro, uh, goes to one final verse and then a final chorus, which becomes the outro. So that's very much a traditional, um, right. That's a formula that's worked for me with the songs that have lyrics. So, now on the other side of that, um, I have a tune called uh, Strange New World. And that one was the first dadgad tune that I ever wrote. Um, Matt Thomas had taught me a whole bunch of really cool tricks and scales and uh, open hammer-ons for that tuning. And that song is actually not repetitive. It's, it's very much an instrumental guitar piece a la Drifting from Andy McKee or um, you know, it's it's very much like a it's meant to be okay. This is about the guitar. Mm -hmm. There's there there's some repetitive things, but it's more of a journey, or odyssey, whatever you whatever you will. Um, right. The example is uh, there's a really great guitar player named Callum Graham, and I've gotten to meet him a couple of times. Well, actually, sorry, just once. Um, it'll be a, I'm meeting him again in January, but he's a more recent addition to the Candy Rat Records label that got Andy famous and Don Ross. Um. He is a very, very melodic song forward, composition forward finger style player. He's got the chops, he's got the accuracy, the you know, the technique down to science as well, but his arrangements and his compositions are just they're so hummable. You know, they get stuck in your head, which right. you can't say that about a lot of instrumental guitar players. Um but a good example is he has a tune called The Channel that he used to win uh, the Canadian Guitar Festival, like four or five years ago, and that tune doesn't repeat at all. It's a journey. It's I, I believe he said he wrote it about a man that's sitting at a channel and he's waiting to die. It's kind of dark, but he's seeing his whole life flash before his eyes. So the song the song starts out so beautiful and just melodic and right. You know, you you really do get the sense that there's this man just staring out at some glass, calm water. You know, but then by the end of the tune, he's getting just so into the percussion and and at the very end of the song he just does this like crazy harmonic run and bends the guitar neck to where it just sounds almost like Jimi hendrix doing the the national anthem right it's right wild. And you hear him beating on the guitar like a heartbeat like a doom, 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 doom. Right. and you get the sense oh the guy is finally passing through so that right. that tune is very much I think it's like seven or eight minutes, but it's a journey. Yeah. Uh, so there's, you know, that doesn't make it any less of a moving song. It's just not repetitive. And it's so it's a journey. But then a lot of his other tunes do follow the basic, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, repetitive parts. I mean, what I found with a lot of um, really established fingerstyle guitar players is <clears throat> they usually stray away from doing the second verse exactly like the first. They'll either they'll either add a harmony, um, you know, like a, a skip a string and do the same, the same melodic idea, but then add the harmony to the second verse, mm -hmm. whereas it wasn't there on the first one, or they'll just play it at a lower or higher register. So that's always a good thing to do for your composition to freshen it up and keep your listener interested. All right. Um, that's something, I mean, I at least try to do. Um, but getting back to how I start these compositions. It's, I always try to just let 
my ears and the heart guide me, you know, yeah. if it's something that I think is going to move people the way it's moving me in that moment when I'm alone with my instrument, then it's, it's a good recipe to follow. So my advice for people writing music is to just follow your melody and follow, you know, d definitely try not to get too caught up in, Oh, this is a cool little roll technique or, Oh, this is, I think people really like this role or people like this scale. Like all right. you can do that all day long, but, uh, you'll probably lose people's interest and they'll probably think of you as just, uh, you know, a guy making noise. So all right. with you coming out with a full instrumental album in the future, mm -hmm. are you veering away from the vocals or is that just for this album and, and that's it? Or how do you find yourself in the future? Yeah. Great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so I still have about six tunes that I'm really happy with that have vocals that I do want to record with Kim person mm -hmm. um, after this album. And that'll, you know, that might be a year or two after this. I try, I'm going to try not to put too much out within too much of a, uh, too close of a gap to the instrumental album, but I'm not departing from writing lyrics at all. Um, I, in fact, while doing the recording with Kim, <laughs> It's like three days, you know, eight hour sessions. It, I didn't want to say I burnt out <laughs> doing the instrumental stuff, but I definitely was like, yeah, I'm going to strum some cowboy chords. When I get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've always had a really big appreciation for contemporary folk artists like, uh, Ray LaMontagne, Gregory Allen, Isakov, uh, Ben Howard. Those are three of my favorite writers. Um, currently I, I really like the, Americana influence thing. Mm -hmm. um, not so. I would never call myself like a, a purist or a folky or anything, but I do really love that simplicity that goes behind their songwriting. You know, uh, really well tailored lyrics over cool musical ideas and time signatures. I, I do like doing that kind of stuff still, but for this album, I'm definitely wanting to push what I've been working on for the solo acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. So, so I get caught up where I get really excited about you know the the instrumental stuff or the guitar stuff specifically but you know you're like me you're out there performing to make a living mm -hmm. i find that most of my audiences don't have the same mindset as me yeah you know i can go and play the like the most awesome guitar solo i think i've ever played and i look out and people like there might be like a couple actual guitarists in the crowd that are paying attention but like the people, the normal people that are at breweries and bars seem to respond to singing the yeah. most, which can be incredibly frustrating because I feel like people just don't understand and respect the fact that what I was doing on the guitar was took much more of my time and my, yeah. like I devoted my life to that. <laughs> and then you start singing, you know, some pop song that they like and they're like, oh, I love that song. Yep. And it's like, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to me, but I, I've, I understand that I, this is how it is. And I have to do yeah. this to make my living. Yeah. But, uh, I wonder with your, you know, it seems like you have the same mindset where the, the instrumentals really do, they, they're fulfilling to you as a musician as, and as an artist, Yeah. do you get out there and find that same thing when you play that you sometimes aren't getting the respect, especially, I mean, I know a listening room is different, but yeah. at your typical venues where people are there for the, to hang out rather than to listen to you like a concert. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to, um, it depends on the venue always. It's always a thing uh, where you have to gauge your crowd. Um, but I, I try to mix in, um, you know, some instrumental covers occasionally, like uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, Girl from Ipanema, Don't Know Why from Nora Jones, I'll do What a Wonderful World, uh, just standards, you know, I'll do Close to You from The Carpenters, um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, stuff like that. And I like to get people warmed up to things that they immediately recognize. Um, one thing that's worth saying is in the instrumental guitar world, um, you're going to have little to no success playing your originals in environments where people are expecting to hear something they're familiar with people just naturally want to celebrate the old um things that they're familiar with um it takes people a little bit to get their guard down um 
especially if you're doing instrumental guitar stuff. So um, I, I typically, part of the reason I started singing is at the open mic, you know, somebody's like, oh, you should try to just sing, you know, try to try to do a couple things that, you know, a couple of your favorite tunes. I was doing Beatles, Beatles stuff at that time. I was like 18. And uh, I was still doing the instrumentals incorporated, but to get people's guard down, you know, it's just a natural thing. They want to hear a voice first. A lot of times um, it's there. There's some gigs like we we're talking about uh, the other day, talking about our retirement home gigs. There's some gigs where people really do appreciate it. Um, just from the get go, they'll, they'll immediately recognize the talent from across the room. And I think, you know, somebody of your, you know, caliber for sure, they recognize the talent, um, straight away. Um, but then if they have a conversation or something, it's easier for them to get more involved with that because there's a human voice involved, which is a more immediate connection that we sense primarily. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's funny with Matt Thomas and I, he's, like I said before, a really great instrumental guitar player. We do some of the same rooms uh, through our agent. And, um, you know, what we like to do at our duo gigs is I always like to disarm people with, you know, a couple songs that they've heard before. I'll work in one or two of my originals that have voice. And then near the end of the set, they're warmed up and they're paying attention. And um, as long as there's interesting banter and the crowd isn't overly stiff, um, it's pretty easy to hook them in. And by that time I introduce Matt and I have him play three or four of his songs. And he's, like I said, he, um, great guitar player. He has a good melodic sense, so he doesn't lose people right away. Um, and so by the time they've warmed up and dropped their guard, it's nice that they'll listen. They'll be like, Holy shit. You know, like this guy's good. Right. You know? So they'll actually appreciate it once they've, you know, dropped their guard per se. Um, I mean, Tommy Manuel, he's, for instance, coming back to him, a lot of his staples are covers, and he, you know, he'll he'll admit it all day long because it's something done well that has worked, and there's no shame in borrowing something from some, you know, people can celebrate. You know, you have to play for your audience, not for yourself. A lot of times, so um, yeah, if you're being yeah, paid, I, if you're being paid to play. Oh, certainly, yeah. Um, but yeah, I do a couple, there's a couple of rooms where I will just do the first set completely instrumental because they have a dinner crowd or something. Mm -hmm. um, like the hunt room, for instance, uh, when I was doing that as a solo gig, all instrumentals. And, you know, some people liked it. Some people were just like, oh, okay, well, whatever, you know, right, background in music. certain venues. What, sorry, what'd you say? I said some people look at it like background music. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, if there's no voice, sometimes people are just quick to be like, oh, okay, well, there's noise happening. Right. <laughs> you can't, you yeah. can't always blame people if they're eating. I, I've been, I don't know if it was in May or April of this year, I went to a little restaurant with some friends I hadn't seen in a while. I was with my wife mm -hmm. and there was a musician there, great local guy. And he, he was great, but I, we were actually there to see the friends that were in town. Yeah. Like, yeah. We, there's that. We had a hard time talking cause we were, it was loud and I've been more conscious yeah. of, especially when people are eating. Um, yeah. I try to keep the volume extra oh, yeah. low because I like, they didn't come for your concert. They're, they're <laughs> eating dinner. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know what, that's, you know, as a, as somebody that tries to promote the art of guitar and performing, you know, that aside, I have to say that that's a good thing for you to say. That's the difference between a professional and just a guy that goes out and plays on the weekends because a compliment that um, I've gotten a couple of times is your volume level is just right. And, you know, and I realize, like you said, like they're not always there for the music. So you have to be conscious of that. I've actually gone, you know, in the past, I've gone on dates to see a couple of local musicians who are awesome. I'm not going to drop in their names. Uh, despite the fact I'm saying they're awesome, but their volume levels were just like, I was like 20 feet away from the stage area and I couldn't have a conversation with my date because they're just tearing into this Jimi Hendrix solo. You know, it's like, it's, it's really distracting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a musician, so my voice wants to hear that too. But for somebody that is there trying to like, I don't know, like work on their chemistry with a new date or something. They do not. Oh God. They're probably the last <laughs> thing they want to focus on is that music, man. <laughs> yeah. So there's always that to consider. Um, yeah. I think it, a lot of it comes down to the venue. 
uh, yeah. and the event that you're playing. Um, yeah. like, like you said, like in terms of a, a bar scene or uh, a dinner or something like that, yeah. you're not the main focus and you always have to keep that in mind. Yeah. You, have, you always have to kind of say, okay, I'm the background. I just want to keep it light. And um, yeah. in terms of being able to, like you said, Joe, like if you've spent a lot of time on something, they're not going to appreciate that. And nor should they. Um, that's not really their focus. But um, I did see on your website, Dustin, that, you know, that you do have specific events where people are coming to see you and that kind of leads me into this the, the other part of the question that i that i was kind of going towards was the uh -huh. the on tour um and people were actually coming out to see you as a musician mm -hmm. um how like how do you how do you see that coming down your line so at the moment um i've sent out a bunch of emails well in the past month or so i was a little late to this game um i have like three booking agents in this area hampton roads okay uh, which is respectively virginia beach norfolk williamsburg chesapeake portsmouth uh you know within an hour of virginia beach uh I play full time but how i'm going to interrupt real quick just to oh. so the audience knows how did you go about and when did you decide to get the 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 booking agent um they a lot of times will reach out to you if okay. um, if you have any merit as a performer and a professional if you're not getting drunk at your gigs or you know singing out of key and stuff then right 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 you've got some actual talent <laughs> yeah they 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 want their commission too and they want to have somebody that they can build a relationship with and that they can use to build their relationship with their venues and their clients mm -hmm. so, um was that something that you were you were seeking out at the time, or I didn't when really they... thing at first when it happened? Uh, like I said, I started with open mics and I was getting gigs. Um, I was covering for people that couldn't like I like I met a couple of people at these open mics that were like, yeah, I do a couple gigs here and there. You know, they had full time jobs, so they weren't serious professionals. But they're like, could you come play and you know for like thirty minutes, I'll, I'll throw you fifty bucks or something like that. So starting really small like that, and then eventually actually these venues are like hey you're actually kind of good so like you know they they book me and then when they promote it comes under the attention of other agents that want to book that venue so they're like okay where'd you get this guy oh we just heard him you know like i can remember going to this irish pub called keegan's it's down the street from me and uh it's playing with bj griffin who's a really great cello player who sings does cover music and stuff and yeah bj is awesome yeah, he's fantastic, and um, he's been good and friends. His uh, piano yeah. player. Yeah, both of them together are doing really good things. Um, excited to see what happens for them. They actually opened for Lionel Richie last year, which is cool. But wow, that is cool. Anyway, uh, so when him and I were playing together a lot, we would just you know try to scope around, and we asked a guy to um, just play a couple at uh, his at his gig, just to you know see how it was. And we weren't gigging seriously at the time, but his agent was there who wasn't like a really uh, established agent in this area. He's kind of near the bottom. Uh, but he, um, he got me a bunch of gigs. And then from there, uh, another agent that actually works with the city and books a lot of the touristy stuff at the ocean front started working with them. And now I'm working with an agent that used to work with them who books far more venues. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's easy to stay busy, but, going back to what you said about what's the next thing is um, I would really like an agent that books, you know, to where I can go up and down the East coast or something like that. Right. Booking your own tour is obviously possible, but it's, it's really hard to get things to line up. It's yeah, so hard. Though. It's a headache. And, <laughs> yeah. So Matt and I, we've played a bunch of venues in like Richmond and Northern Virginia area. I've played a couple in North Carolina triangle area. And, um, you know, it's easy to do those kind of things spread out. It's a little harder to organize a tour for yourself to where you're on the road for at least a week, you know? Right. So that's what I would like a booking agent for. I've opened for a couple of people at like Jam and Java mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, that's an awesome venue. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. And I opened for a guy from Ireland there. I was like, how do you, you know, he's just like a really good solo singer songer. I was like, how do you book these kind of things? Like, how do you have a tour set up? He's like, Oh, I just, you send out enough emails and eventually somebody will respond. You know, that was his short answer. So I've been working on that. Um, I'm also affiliated with 
concerts in your home right now, which is something that came under my radar a year and a half ago. That's a really cool organization. Um, there's a lot of hosts um, throughout the country. Actually, it's a, I think it's a worldwide thing now. Wow. But, wow. Um, That's cool. Yeah, there's people that have these, you know, nice houses and nice, like, open living rooms and, you know, sonically uh, pleasing rooms. For instance, Matt and I played one in um, Richmond week before last, and it was the best one we've ever played. There was, like, 60 people in attendance, and we w- rolled up to the house, and it's, like, a castle. So these you know, house concerts, quote-unquote, that a lot of these hosts have are actually people that just – they're devoted music fans that, you know – go to concerts all the time and it's just not enough for them. So they have touring artists of a high caliber come to their house. And the cool thing for the artists is um, they get fed, they get lodging for that night. They let them stay the night. Really? They get to use their shower, you know, which is a, <laughs> it's a luxury. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so uh, Daniel Champagne, he's a really, uh, really, really great performer from Australia that, came to Virginia beach a while ago and Matt and I opened for him and he would stay with us. And, you know, he was, he, I think he, he does somehow more shows than I do a year. I do, um, last year was, what does that say? 247 shows. I think he did like almost 300. So this dude's always on the road. I I mean, he just flies out to Canada, flies out to uh, New Zealand, flies out to Australia, goes to the States. He'll do like little runs all over the place. Um, and he told me about concerts in your home and it's, it's really cool. We've done, I think three so far. And, and also the, the cool thing is the people that come to these shows, they're quiet, like they're quiet, they're engaging They're They will, they do what's called, you know, suggested donation at the door or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. usually it's like 20 bucks a person. They'll buy a CD. So like at the end of the night, if you've had like 50 or 60 people there, do the math, it's pretty nice. Yeah. So yeah. I'd like to Absolutely. do that kind of thing full time a lot of what like Daniel and Daniel Champagne and a lot of the artists that I look up to are doing is they're doing a mixture of house concerts in between their listening room venues. Um, so they're not banking just on success from their listening room uh, gigs because I mean, things happen. Sometimes people don't show up, you know? Right. So it's nice that they have that uh, cover in between that. That's what I'd really like to do full time is do that. Um, it would just be like a breath of fresh air. You know, I've been doing the uh, mix of cover and original gigs in this area for almost seven years now. Mm. So um, it's kind of like breathing and it's, it's fun. Cause I go into autopilot mode, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, it, it's, it's really nice to play for a quiet, appreciative audience. And there's a limited amount of venues in this area that have that. So those kind of shows are, I, I'd rather play for, it, it's always quality over quantity, you know, yeah, like, oh, yeah. I don't have big dreams of playing the amphitheaters, so um, maybe I should, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy venues like Jam and Java, and you know, venues that have ample seating, you know, a couple hundred people, but it's quiet. There's a good PA. They have a sound guy that knows what they're doing. Jam and Java's been a great experience. Um, what's the What's the other place I've been wanting to play? Um, in around oh, here or in here. Yeah. I'd really oh, like to play. Yeah. It's funny. Have you ever played so I came from more of a, a rock background. Um mm-hmm. and then I kind of went into jazz, but I I, I love rock music. But uh mm-hmm. the thing that really hooked me into this entire thing was the thrill of playing like live rock shows. Yeah. Like being on stage so up in Northern Virginia, DC area, I was playing in bands and we were often playing rooms like Iota, which I think is sadly closed, but that's that was in Clarendon and Arlington, the Rock mm-hmm. and Roll Hotel. There are all these venues that were uh, Gypsy Sally's we played at. Um, they were like rock clubs that could fit a couple hundred people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people there's a stage sound guy. And everyone's super focused, but it's definitely not loud. I mean, definitely not quiet and focused. It's like a, it, there's a huge amount of energy and it's all focused on the music. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where I got my original, just like, this is the best feeling mm-hmm. in the whole world. Yep. Um, have you ever been a part of that sort of thing? Or have you always been a part of um, maybe quieter, prettier music in general? 
Mm-hmm. I, I did the band thing for a while. Um, when I first started gigging in the area, it was pushed on me by an agent. Oh, you should do more band gigs. It'll get you higher exposure. And it did. Um, actually got to open for Vertical Horizon at the 31st Street stage. And that was that was pretty cool. Um, <sighs> being a band leader is not the funnest thing. At least it wasn't for me. Um, it was. I had a really great drummer, CJ LeBeau, for a while. He moved to Nashville with his brother to pursue music. His brother was a great songwriter as well, singer. Um, Jackson LeBeau. But um, we played for about as long as he was here. And then after he left, I was like kind of without a drummer. And I went through two drummers, you know, learned two or three hours of material with them. And then they would either flake because there was a higher pay gig or whatever. So it became a thing. Like I have a great bass player, uh, Clint Cockrum from Red Clover Ghost, who is like-minded in that he likes the Americana singer songwriter stuff as well. Um, Yeah. Great bass player, great guy. Um, So I still have him to play certain gigs with, um, but I never really recovered a drummer. So I was like, I'm not going to like go out of my way to do this. And the other thing is, um, you know, when you play with the band, you obviously, depending on the venue, a lot of times you make less than if you're solo or duo. Right. So that's a thing, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm money hungry, but I'm, that, I'm with you when you're, yeah. When you do it full time and don't have a side job, you do have to be smart about accepting because, you know, it'd be the summertime when there's like, when I'd have five gigs a week on average and you know, I would have, I, I had said yes to all these band gigs where I'm making X amount and then I get offers for a solo gig that pays twice as much. Mm. And that wouldn't happen like once a month. It happened a couple times cause I booked all these gigs in advance by a couple months. So I'm like, okay, well I just lost over $2,000 this summer, you know? Right. Right. So that, uh, but it also sounds like the Americana the style finger style seems to speak to you a little bit more than the... it does. And I enjoy it a lot more. I, you know, when I played with the band, it was a lot more strummy Dave Matthews sounding. To be honest, I, I went through a really big Dave Matthews band phase. Right. And if you listen to the sound you call home, my first album. There's a couple tunes on there that really do sound like a Dave Matthews band style, even the songwriting and the um, you know general sound is very Dave esque just take away the saxophone, the violin player. <laughs> right, right. right. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing was fun. And it's, you know, there's a lot of energy and adrenaline that goes into it. Um, but I was like, I, I can't do this all the time. It's just, it's so taxing um, with rehearsal and stuff. I, I just, I enjoy more playing with Matt and doing solo gigs. You know, it's just, it clears my mind up and lets me stay focused on the instrument, which at the end of the day is like my real passion. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I, I identify with that. I think that a lot of us um, kind of have to go through this period of finding out who we are as yeah. a musician. Yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know for me, uh, when I started playing, uh, I was in a death metal band. And yeah. although I loved it, it was extremely technically challenging. And uh-huh. over time, um, uh, it wasn't me. You know what I mean? When I actually sat down in my in my living room and grabbed the acoustic guitar or, or grabbed an electric, yeah. it's not. It wasn't my first tendency to go to. It wasn't what I naturally wrote. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. Took, that took me years to to kind of figure out. Okay, um, that's not who I am. Although I really enjoy it. Yeah, that's yeah. not who I am. Yeah, definitely. And you know, when you grow your music palette, uh, your musical palette definitely grows too. I, I mentioned earlier, my dad. Um, basically, I don't want to say force fed me Stevie Ray Vaughan because I love Stevie Ray Vaughan still. Right. Uh, but, you know, he listened to that all day. That Carlos Santana, um, you know, just old rock and roll and blues, heavy stuff. And believe it or not, Ozzy Osbourne was like, his, he somehow scored like the, ni- the best ac- electric guitarist, at least to my memory. Randy Rhodes was like the guy that wrote crazy train and arranged a lot of Ozzy's first hits as yeah. a solo. Oh yeah. Um, Post black Sabbath. He, uh, he was a fantastic player. And I realized the reason was because he was classically trained. Right. Um, you know, he really knew how to arrange good tunes. He knew how to flow in and out of those crazy chord changes and, you know, 
stuff like that. So my dad, I, I have a lot to thank for that rock and roll early influence. Like I said, I had a Ibanez as my first guitar. So I was a shredder for a while. I tried to, you know, I don't want to say I was good, but I, I tried my damnedest to nail those 80s solos from like, you know, <laughs> right. you know, Quiet Riot, you know, yeah. anything from Ozzy was like my jam, Van Halen, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. You know, but I would never, <laughs> I would never even try to do something like that. <laughs> never, never, ever, ever. I mean, I right. actually find some of my cover gigs. I do cover Led Zeppelin, but they had a, they had a folk influence, so it works. You know, right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a bunch of those. Yeah, I do. Uh, Over the hills and far away. Hey, what can I do? Going to California, cashmere. So, cool. Yeah, that works for solo acoustic guitar, and even better when it's a duo. I, I mean, I use the loop pedal for my solo stuff, but. When I play with Matt, it becomes a full band sound because he has his guitar set up like mine, but even better to where he has like four or five pickups that pick up all the percussive elements that are all EQ'd separately. And it just, it sounds like a machine. I mean, it's crazy. So um, we do a couple fun stuff like that. We do some Jimi Hendrix, some, uh, you know, Santana, Steve Ray Vaughan, like I said. <clears throat> but yeah, man, rock and roll, there's the influence of it was very paramount at the beginning uh but nowadays it's i've quieted down <laughs> well you've i think you like you said I, I think you found yourself and you're kind of you're you're carving your own path yeah it's cool uh any mckee he also is a big fan of like the you know he'll, he'll openly voice that you know his his main interest isn't always solo acoustic guitar you know what got him famous and whatnot he a lot of the more recent things he's been posting have just been him like jamming to 80s music <laughs> you know just having fun he's a right he's a big dream theater fan a lot of right, yeah a lot of the i've noticed more recent um solo acoustic guitar guys that are getting a lot of attention are really prog rock focused and for good reason i mean they apply that to acoustic guitar and it sounds freaking unreal you know the time signature changes and the voicings and all that stuff so yeah absolutely pretty cool to see what people are doing now and uh, you know fret monkey records has a really nice roster of players that like Travis Bowman, Kevin Blatnick, and Adrian Ballou that are just doing all these crazy shredded, I mean, just, it's acoustic shred. It's the only way I can describe it, but they somehow make it musical to where it's like, oh, wow, you know, it sounds like a machine in a sense that it's like, you know, it's not, it's not for say my preferred finger style hmm. uh, subgenre, but it's, it's really impressive. And it, I would definitely go to a show of it, you know, just, uh, just out of curiosity, have you ever heard of a, a, finger style uh, his name is adrian leg yeah I've, I've heard that name several times okay yeah i saw him open for joe satriani and eric johnson oh. um, a number of years ago wow. uh, just completely blew my mind it was and, and it was crazy because it was a rock concert you know yeah. joe satriani but adrian leg opens and the entire crowd is like quiet and everybody's focused on this like 60 year old guy just ripping it up and i was just like wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great i need to look that up did you say uh is it spelled like l-e-g-g -G or something yes or? correct l-e-g-g -G. got it yeah, yeah I'll look that up man that's i've heard that name a couple times but i i definitely don't have a face or a sound to go with it yeah, yeah he uh he's obviously very proficient uh but he also does this detuning while he plays it's it's oh yeah, yeah it's rather interesting he's pretty popular with a lot of guys uh if you uh pay any attention to you know who's going viral in the acoustic finger style guitar universe uh, as i do like to be current uh, there's a guy alexander misco who just mm -hmm has been blowing up because he has the banjo tuners on his acoustic oh. he'll tune throughout the song his melodies i mean he'll even go up and down like a whammy bar style like and it sounds he makes it sound musical to where it's like at first you're like i hate this kid then you're like oh wow <laughs> <laughs> right right um, yeah, yeah he's actually playing melodies with the tuning peg oh absolutely yeah look up wow. uh, just type in Misco. It's M I S K O. Okay, um, okay. I'm sure it'll pop up. But he, his most recent one that went viral was uh, Careless Whisper. He did the saxophone line with the bend. He yeah. made the natural harmonics and then he did the. Yeah, I can't sing it now because my voice is screwed. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he makes it sound very musical. And on top of that, he's doing voicings on the middle strings, holding the bass notes, and somehow. 
It's, it's just messed up. It really That's is. You have to check him he, out. He covers the full band sound just as good as, you know, Tommy or Andy McKee or, you know, whoever. Mike Dawes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to give a shout out. You mentioned Eric Johnson. I love Eric. Everybody should know that. Uh, <laughs> everybody, knows, everybody knows that, Joe. <laughs> I, it's my. It's one of my missions in life to make sure anybody who's not heard Eric Johnson listens to Eric Johnson. But Eric is a great uh, fingerstyle player, too. Yep. I've been working on Song for George this week, uh, one of his originals. and I have to listen to that. I don't think I've heard that. Or if I did, I, I need to listen to it again. I know Andy McKee, when he talks about his defining guitar moment, it was listening to uh, Clips of Dover. I think that's Yeah. Yeah. He that's Jack, that. yeah. And he was like, oh, wow, there's instrumental guitar on the radio. <laughs> mm-hmm. so that was his defining moment. So, it, you know, it stands to reason that that should, that, it, that should be a good reference point. Yeah, Eric, uh, he's a, you know, he plays piano and he's a multi-instrumentalist. But uh, that song in particular, he does in double drop detuning and mm. he's essentially playing in uh, like D Mixolydian. Yeah. Uh, gets a great, great sound out of it. Sounds like Eric, but finger style. <laughs> George is what it's called. Song for George, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna look that up as soon as we get off here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> one one thing I want to ask you before we we get off, um, we've done a whole episode on practice in the past, mm-hmm. but I'm I I think I like practicing more than anything in the whole world, pretty much, other than like my wife and my dog. But like <laughs> I literally could just practice all the time and not i'd be happy if i'd never performed and never taught if i could just practice all day every day good day for practicing (laughs) yeah but uh i i actually enjoy the process of practicing and i Mm -hmm. i have a very i mean i here's i've got my notebook where i document like every minute of my day every day for the past several years Mm -hmm. uh, because i want to maximize my practice routine Mm -hmm. um what so i guess it's a two-part question for you what is your practice routine and along with that what do you recommend to players that want to get more into you know solo finger style guitar what are the where should you spend your time what are some of the resources out there that you would recommend to help you you know books and that sort of thing yeah um that's first of all, that's that's really cool that you do that um, with your practice time. And I know that you said you teach a lot, so that definitely makes sense. Um, practice does uh, make a huge difference for, for me. Um, so I initially started learning with tabs. And I've mm-hmm. gotten good enough with tabs to where um, I can usually learn a tune, like sight read a tab, even if it's finger style nowadays, as long as I have an idea of what the tune is going into it, because obviously a tab doesn't really have a time signature or anything. Uh, but, um, you know, for instance, Hana by Masake Kishibe is a finger style standard. Um, it's a really great tune in open D, D, A, D, F sharp, A, D. Um, and I learned, uh, Andy covered that song a long time ago and I was just like, I just want to learn it for fun. Um, I, I basically learned it just by the tab. So for people that don't know how to read tabs or have considered, I think it's, if you want to learn something really fast, if you get good at learning tabs um, or reading tabs, I should say, and then transposing it, um, it it's if you don't learn music theory, it's a good substitute for learning something really fast. Um, so I, I did that for a while. Now, in terms of practice, how I, I, I don't learn a lot of new tunes by tab nowadays. Uh, it's only few and far between. If I want to learn something really fast and then just put the tab away after a couple minutes. That's all I'll do. But um, in terms of practice, like having dedicated sessions with an with the intent of getting smoother runs or smoother techniques or something like that, you know, I only do that maybe a tenth of the time that I'm practicing. For me, what I think of practice is I think of um, – getting things perfectly under my fingers and letting muscle memory take over. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm nearly as disciplined with practice probably as yourself or as a lot of um, people that are uh, theory forward or, you know, uh, precision forward. Um, I, I, I I saw this thing as an interview with um, Tommy Manuel. This is, this could probably be the last time I mentioned him before I sound like the ultimate fanboy. Um, (laughs) 
uh, he had this really, really cool interview that I thought was just awesome that spoke to me. And um, if you've seen him play, which you have, you, you know that this guy, I mean, he's breathing. Like when his guitar playing to him, even in the most difficult arrangements is breathing. It's like, he's not thinking about his hands. He's not thinking about any sort of insecurity. He's not thinking about, Oh, here comes this part. It's going to be hard. No, he's like looking out and smiling at his fans and being goofy and, you know, just enjoying the music. And in this interview, he talks about, you know, somebody asked him about practice the way you just asked me. And he was basically like, I practice my tunes until I'm like, sick of them until I can hold a conversation with somebody until my hands and my muscle memory know the song just as well as I do in my mind, you know? So what I like to do, um, for my songs is I do just that. I, I repeat them and I repeat them and I repeat them and I repeat them. And I, you know, I don't care if it gets boring. I'll, you know, I'll go make a strong cup of tea or something and I'll just keep doing it. Um, and I think that's the secret to like, just obviously having confidence on stage. If I want to go play a new tune that I've rehearsed, you know, for only an hour on stage, it might sound like a good idea until, you know, I'm like, okay, here comes the bridge. Oh shit. You know? So I like to get, Oh, maybe a little more technical way to answer your question is I always like to um, practice sections of songs, like get them just perfect, smooth as butter. Yeah, um, and I and after I've gotten those sections just to where I don't have to look at the fretboard or I can close my eyes or to where I can hold a conversation with somebody, tap my foot, do whatever, to where it becomes it you it normally takes a few days, if not weeks, to get it, you know, so in the pocket that I don't have to think about it with my mind. Mm. Um I like to do those with each section and then I'll piece it together and then <clears throat> once I've pieced the tune together that's when I'll start practicing, practicing it from point A to point B, like no in between. If I mess up, just keep going. Um, just to get a sense of, okay, I've gotten through this a bunch of times, you know, like for a girl from Ipanema, that song is only like a minute long. Um, when I first learned it and put it together, it took me like at least two or three weeks before I was like, okay, I have this minute long complex melody and chord progression under my fingers to where, I don't have to think about it. And so now when I do my cover gigs, it's nice. It's nice and relaxed. I can enjoy the music. I can look out at people and smile. And I can, if somebody asks me like to do a cover of something while I'm playing, which so many people like to do, it's <laughs> annoying. Um, <laughs> they love to come up and talk to you like while you're in the middle of a solo. Yeah. yeah and I'm like, I, I can't even, <laughs> yeah. even respond. I'm like trying to remember what I'm playing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So doing that kind of thing, it's nice to, you know, if the manager comes over and is like, Hey, this or that, or this or that, you know, you can still keep playing and not miss a beat, hopefully most times. So, you know, it's, just, it's nice to basically my point is repeat something until you do not have to think about it with your head, you know, until once your hands have it. Um, you know, and also it helps a lot. If you really want to maximize your practice, practice with the same guitar. Um, I, I, I make it a point when I'm, for instance, there's one more tune that I have to record with Kim. Um, and I'm still working out. I, I have the bridge, but I'm still working it out to where I'm like, okay, am I a hundred percent pleased with that? I've got like two or three different options of how to come out from the bridge back to the theme. And that's always a tricky thing because you don't want it to be predictable, but you don't want it to be too weird. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by weird, I just mean like off the wall to where it doesn't suit the song. Um, so I've been practicing that on one guitar and that tune I've, kept it on that guitar because my right hand knows it's kind of a boom chick forward song on some parts and in other parts there's open strings and it has a wide string space whereas Larave and one of my other Benetos has a two and a quarter bridge space and this one has two and five sixteenths so I prefer that I don't want to be making my right hand have to be precise I just want to focus on getting through the song so it's good to practice with one guitar for one song. You can switch to the other guitar once you have that song under your fingers. You know, like I don't, I almost never, this sounds bad, but I almost never practice with my Lair Bay at home. It's like, it's my working instrument. Um, it's set up to sound good live. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> that being said, the actions, it's not buzzy, but it's low. It's not the most um, supersonically 
big sounding guitar compared to the Benetos. I mean, to some people, it probably would sound incredible, like a million bucks, but I have the, the Benetos as my reference, so I prefer to practice with those. Um, and so when I gig with the Larive, um, oftentimes I've practiced those tunes on my Benetos because they're more comfortable and ergonomic and responsive. So it does take me a little bit to get used to it. Like for instance, Girl from Ipanema, wider spacing on my Benetos. So it was easier to play on the Benetos like I did in the YouTube video. When I started playing with the Larive, it felt like I was switching to electric because the spacing is thinner. And it took me a while to get used to that. So now <clears throat> I prefer to play it on Larive because I mostly play Girl from Ipanema when I'm at a gig versus sitting in my studio. Um, and so, you know, yeah, basically the point is practice on one guitar until you've got it really good and then you can switch it up and throw your muscle memory off, do whatever you want. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that, that helps a lot because every guitar with a different shape and spacing makes your right hand have to do something different. So, yeah. It's been super fun, guys. Really appreciate you having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Dustin, can you uh, let everybody know where they can go to find out more information about you? Yeah, certainly. Uh, www.dustinfurlow.com. Furlow spelled F-U-R-L-O-W. Facebook, Instagram, Dustin Furlow. Yeah, I, I post where I'm playing at usually once a week. Just post like the list of gigs um, and my YouTube channel as well. Um, I try to update that fairly often, but I've got a bunch of my originals on there and also Spotify and iTunes. You can find my music. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And hopefully a future album coming out in early spring. Yep. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, that's going to be the Woodscapes, right? Yeah. Woodscapes is the name of that. It's going to be a 10 track instrumental acoustic album. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. I uh, look forward to seeing you around town and yeah, man. It's been great having you on Fred Buzz. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the offer to be on the show, man. It means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you for coming, man. Yeah. We like geeking out about this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to it all week. It's yeah. Fun, man. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All yeah. right. I'm signing out. Yep. Everybody have a good day. Yeah. See you later. See ya. Yeah. Nice meeting you. All right. See ya. <laughs>